public safety issue. And we've had multiple people killed while walking or biking on the parts of Mass Ave we're talking about today, including Bernard Lavins, Sharon Hamer, and Daryl Willis in the past few years. There's real urgency to this work, uh, and I appreciate the time and effort that uh, city staff and others have put into this uh, to meet that urgency and the needs of our residents, our workers, and our local businesses. Um, so as I mentioned, we're going to go first to city staff who have a pres presentation uh, and then to a group of local businesses and Safe Streets advocates who are going to present jointly. Um, so we'll turn it over first to, to city staff. I know um, Joe Barr is here with us. Oh, and I also um, have a note, I um, just want to remind folks uh, if they would like to sign up online to speak for public comment, um, uh, we'll be doing public comment after those presentations. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Sabrina Wheeler and other council members. Um, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to uh, have this conversation and, and present, present to you. Um, just in, by way of introductions, um, I'm joined this uh, afternoon slash evening uh, by um, uh, staff from the my department from the Department of Public Works and from the Community Development Department. So presenting with me um, this uh, afternoon are uh, Kathy Watkins, the, chief, the city engineer, uh, Patrick Baxter, who's our engineering manager, and um, Brooke McKenna, who's the director for street management, traffic and parking. Uh, and we're also joined uh, by uh, the Commissioner of Public Works, Ona Reardon, uh, the Assistant City Manager for Community Development, Aram Farouk, uh, as well as the uh, Director of the Environmental and Transportation Planning Division of Community Development, Suzanne Rasmussen. I believe that's the city staff who are here, and I apologize to anyone I might have missed. Um, uh, in any case, uh, before we go into the um, details of the um, Mass Ave 4 report. I just wanted to very briefly go over um, the uh, progress update report on the cycling safety ordinance that we submitted um, last uh, uh, well, early, earlier this month, as it turns out. It was, it, was, it was technically due at the end of last month. We got in a couple days late, but uh, hopefully still relevant for everyone. Um, and, and really what that does is just, it's a requirement of the ordinance uh, it provides a, um, an update on the projects we've implemented, the projects we're going to be working on over the next 12 months, uh, and then a, any other sort of information that's, that's ongoing. Um, and the only thing I really wanted to highlight in that is just that in the list of projects, um, you can see um, on the, hopefully on the screen, that you know, our focus over the next year is really on Mass Ave, not the segments we're going to be talking about the rest of today's hearing, but the rest of Mass Ave, which is required to be have separated bicycle lanes um, by um, the by April, end of April of next year. So we don't have a lot of time uh, to get that work done. Um, so other, and, and then other than the central square portion, which is part of a capital project that DPW will be doing uh, over the next few years. Um, so the, um, like, like I said, as you can see, the, the real focus is on Mass Ave and all these bits and pieces as well as some more significant segments um, that are uh, coming up uh, in the near future. Uh, two I just wanted to highlight, one is the Mid-Mass Ave project, which is the area from Inman Street up to um, uh, uh, Trowbridge Street, uh, which uh, we've been talking about and we're pretty much ready to implement. Um, the one hiccup there is we discovered from our uh, contractor uh, really earlier this week that um, you probably heard that there's been supply chain issues with construction materials up and down the industry. And unfortunately, that's, that is also hitting the transportation industry. So we're, we're waiting on our vendor and our contractor to, to be able to provide the flex post for that project. Uh, so that may delay us a little bit, um, but we are pretty much ready to go with that. Uh, and we'll implement that as soon as we can once we have the materials uh, that we need. Uh, and then the other one is just, um, LA Park, sorry, the section of Mass Ave from Elway Park Parkway to Dudley Street, which is the one which is kind of beyond the segments that we're discussing tonight, beyond where the overhead catenary for the trackless trolleys exists. Uh, and although we've not launched the public outreach for that, we are planning to move forward with that in the very near future, because that's another critical segment, fairly lengthy segment that needs to get done uh, within the next, you know, call it 10 and a half months at this point uh, in June. 
Um, so like I said, Mass Ave is our main focus. Um, we're also, the River Street project is also, you know, moving forward and construction should begin within the next, um, within that next year of, of, of time. Uh, and then there's, you know, bits and pieces here and there that we're, we'll be getting along the way, all of which we estimate adding up to close to five miles of projects that will happen between, you know, now and next April, uh, in addition to the approximately, let me find the right section here, approximately a little over four miles of projects that we did uh, before this past April. Um, so we are, you know, keeping on track with the requirements in the ordinance in terms of both, you know, the streets we need to get done, but also the mileage that we need to complete. Uh, and so, you know, hopefully that, that progress both this past year and in the coming year uh, demonstrates, you know, that we are you know, obviously taking this project or the, this ordinance and the requirements of it extremely seriously and, you know, working very hard to get that, get all that, that work done. So anyway, just wanted to briefly go into that, um, but then jump from there into talking about um, the, uh, uh, there we go, um, talking about the, the Mass F4 progress report. Um, so sorry, I just went, or sorry, um, not the Mass F4 progress report, but the impacts report. So we went through the progress report. So the impacts report, which again is the main topic of tonight's meeting, um, I just wanted to provide some context before we go into any details. Uh, the, you know, the ordinance requires us to install separated bike lanes on these segments of Mass Ave as well as the entire length of Mass Ave. So I just wanted to make sure, you know, everyone's clear. We, we fully recognize that need. We, and we have every intent to do that. Um, and so it's really just a question of, of how we do that and what kind of, um, design choices we make through that process. But, uh, I just want to be very clear because some of the correspondence we've gotten over the last week or so has somewhat questioned whether we were, you know, fully intending to do this and, and whether this was somehow uh, part of some more elaborate attempt to not do it. And I just want to be very clear. We, you know, we, we both recognize this is an ordinance requirement, but also that this is the thing that we need to do because it's the right thing to do to make uh, cycling in Cambridge safer. You know, it is the, the, the spine of, of Cambridge. Um, it is, uh, you know, the most significant corridor in the city, um, if not to some extent, even in the region, um, and making it, you know, work for cyclists in a safer and more comfortable way is, is incredibly important. And so that's, I just want to make sure everyone recognizes that we, that we recognize that. Um, the report we submitted is, is not a plan. It's, it's, it's and, and what all that you see is all that we have. We've not progressed to design beyond sort of cross sections that are shown in the report, and I'll, and I'll show those uh, in a minute. Um, and it really is intended, as the ordinance requires, to look at what would the impacts be if we were to go purely with a quick build, meaning just paint and post um, separated bike lanes on Mass Ave uh, with no construction at all, um, which, to be clear, we're, we don't think is the best solution for this corridor and certainly these segments of this corridor. Um, and, but we, you know, we needed to show what those impacts would be per the ordinance. And so that's really what this report is. We, uh, you know, we, we know, we, we do not intend to implement that version of the plan unless we're sort of can't get to a point where we have any, any other choice, which I hope is not the outcome we get to, uh, over the next year or so. Um, and you know, we, it's really the starting point for a conversation about, you know, how we move forward with putting in separated bike lanes, what that looks like, um, you know, whether parts of it or all of it are quick bill, which again, I don't think is the solution we think is going to be the best, but certainly it could be a portion of it could be quick build if that makes sense, or how we move forward with construction, which will take more time, but can reduce the impacts. Uh, some of the problems that people have, you know, rightly identified with the impacts that are shown in that report. Um, and, you know, that requires um, us to work closely with the council and the community over the next, you know, 10, 10 and a half months to get that uh, construction timeline approved uh, by the council. So, you know, we, we, our intent is that we're going to be working collaboratively in a consultation with the community and with other stakeholders and, and very importantly with the entire city council um, to figure out like, what is the best plan? How do we move this forward? Recognizing that this is a really important goal. Uh, and we have every intention of achieving it, but you know, how do we get to separation on these four segments of Mass Ave? Um, so the locations we're talking about uh, have you know, kind of extenuating circumstances that make it 
you know, difficult or, or possibly in some cases, you know, truly not possible to do quick build. Um, so they're, you know, they're, they're basically all on Mass Ave. Um, you know, the two major segments are the, uh, from Dudley to Beach Street, uh, and then from Roseland Street to Waterhouse, that's A and B on the map. And then smaller segments near Harvard Square, which are really um, mostly major bus stops. Um, and so that's Garden Street to Church Street in the northbound direction, which is, I believe, technically Peabody Street, but uh, for these purposes, we're gonna make it part of the Mass Ave 4 as we, as we term these, and then Dunster Street to Plimpton Street, which is the area in front of Holio Gate, where there's a, a, a lot of buses that stop and lay over. Um, so that's really what we're talking about today. Um, to, to create this report, though, we did have to make some assumptions. So although this is not a plan for the corridor, we couldn't really evaluate the impacts without making certain assumptions about what that what a quick build separated bike lane would look like, because you can't analyze impacts if you don't have at least some sort of plan or concept of what you're going to do. Um, so. Um, in those two primary areas, A and B, which are really the, the most challenging from a, you know, physical perspective, and 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 you know we have a lot of different possibilities, and those are the areas where there's catenary wires over the road. Um, the primary design that we were looking at uh, includes a separated bike lane and then two general travel lanes, um, and and does require the removal of of most, if not all, of the parking. Again, that's not a design that we're necessarily recommending or proposing, but that's what a sort of very simple quick build um, design for this segment would look like. We also did look at two alternatives. Uh, one provides a parking lane instead of a second travel lane, and the other instead of a travel lane, sorry, instead of a parking lane adjacent to the separated bike lane, we looked at peak hour bus lanes and then off-peak loading to accommodate you know, the need for transit priority as well as the need for loading along the corridor. But when we looked at the impacts of that, particularly the traffic and public safety impacts of that, um, it became clear that those two alternative designs were really not workable from a public safety perspective. Uh, and we'll get into a little bit more about what that means, particularly with in terms of the impact on the fire department and fire op firefighting operations. Um, but in the end, you know, even though we weren't looking to eliminate those two options, when we really drilled down into them a little bit more, we realized that they were not things that we felt comfortable we could support from a public safety uh, perspective. Um, so I'm gonna switch over to, um, if, I, if my computer will allow this, um, to the uh, Mass Ave 4 report. Uh, and just, I'm not gonna go in detail about it. I just wanna walk people through what's actually in there. Um, and I, I just wanna say for both this report and the the update report, these are pro these are reports that are intended to be reviewed online. We did provide the council with sort of screenshots of them, uh, but they really are designed to be primarily online and to be as accessible as possible, both in terms of the widest audience, so they're, they're optimized for mobile viewing, but also making sure they are accessible uh, you know, for, for those with, with disabilities. Um, so again, just very quick breeze through it. Um, this is a summary of the report, so the sections that are in there is background information on the ordinance and why this report is required. We looked at general impacts. So there's certain impacts that are felt throughout all of these locations and are kind of categorized into general categories and then location specific impacts. Um, so the, the ordinance requires a sort of block by block review of certain impacts. And so that's what we, that's, that's you know, what that, you know, location specific is really the block by block analysis of things like traffic, uh, impacts, parking impacts, um, you know, it's important to say there's both positive and negative impacts to this, you know, obviously implementing separated bike lanes makes the corridor safer for pretty much all users, not just cyclists, um, and has other beneficial impacts on, you know, the environment uh, and so travel patterns, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then finally in the report, we looked, it, it provides some more details if anyone wants to you know, learn more about those alternatives that we, that I just mentioned, so the alternatives we considered, and then what the next steps are. Um, so as you scroll through the report, you know, there's a bunch of information and maps, um, and you can kind of see it, 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 as you move through it, information comes and goes, um, you know, and there's a lot of detail in here, both about, you know, the, the background, like I said, the general impacts, um, you know, things like, um, you know, impacts on safety for people walking, um, impacts on safety for people who are driving, uh, which we also feel are positive, impacts on transit. Um, so again, these are sort of similar throughout the entire 
corridor. So I won't go through all of those, but that's just kind of a feel for what's what's in there. And then you get into the location specific impacts and, and that's where we start, like I said, going block by block. Um, and you know, this is kind of a summary table of what those impacts are. Um, and then the only other thing I just wanted to mention is that for each block or each set of blocks to certain blocks are sort of very similar and they're grouped together. There's both a map view um, showing kind of the area and, and the parking and other you know, impacts and changes, but then also this kind of slider where you can go from the existing addition, which is a Google Street View, to what the overlay of what the, um, the, the design with a quick build separated bike lane would look like. So for example, this is Plimpton Street to Dunster Street and Harvard Square. So this is what it is today. Uh, and then overlaid on top of that is what it would be in the future. Um, you know, with the separated bike lane located adjacent to the curb. Again, if we were to do a quick build, um, none of these consider the possibility of any level of construction, which as you'll see later, is something we feel is, is fairly necessary. So anyway, so then you just go through all these lots and lots of cross sections and lots of lots of information. So I'm gonna scroll down a little bit more quickly this way. Uh, and then you get to the end of all that. And again, you get into these, a little bit more detail on these alternatives we looked at, which I just mentioned and what the, the issues and reasons why we ultimately decided that we weren't gonna consider those and then the next steps, what comes next with, um, with these projects. Um, so anyway, that's a very hopefully relatively quick, very quick breeze through what's in the report. Um, so now we're gonna go back to the presentation. I'm gonna turn it over to Patrick Baxter to talk about um, the traffic analysis that was done. Thank you, Joe. So I'd just like to talk a little bit about kind of the, the methods we use for traffic analysis and then, you know, what we saw for, for impacts um, at the locations where we would expect to change the number of travel lanes or otherwise affect the capacity of, of Mass Ave. Um, so starting off with methods, we analyzed um, the key intersections. We had volumes from 2016, so they're kind of pre-COVID, so we're not including um, any COVID-related volume decreases. Um, and those were obtained from the Mass Ave Transit study that was uh, performed in 2016. Um, we put together a traffic analysis model using software called PTV Vistro, um, which is basically a, a micro simulation model that allows us to kind of model each intersection on a case by case basis and kind of test different scenarios. And all these analyses are using the um, kind of industry standard analysis that uh, follows the highway capacity manual methodology. So when we're analyzing the intersections, we're kind of looking at two criteria to see, you know, as we change an intersection, how are we affecting this and how is it going to affect people um, traveling down the road and vehicles and buses. Um, so the, the two criteria that we're analyzing are average control delay, which is the amount of time that a vehicle passing through the intersection is delayed compared to how they would travel through if the intersection was free flow and there was no traffic signal at that location. And then the Q, which is just the length of the line of stop vehicles. We look at both the 50th percentile, so the rough average Q, as well as the 95th percentile to understand are there locations where that Q would back up past the end of a turn lane or back up through an adjacent intersection, which can cause kind of compounding issues and, and gridlock. Um, also, one other assumption we're assuming in locations without bus lanes, um, those delays and queues would impact the buses at the same level as other vehicles. Well, you know, if there is a bus lane, then obviously that um, delay that the vehicles experience would not be experienced by the people riding the bus. Um, so, you know, in most locations in this report, the alternative that we've discussed um, removes the parking and maintains the two travel lanes. Um, this is most locations along the corridor. In these locations, we're not expecting um, any significant impact to delay. There is certainly the potential that if a vehicle illegally stopped in one of the travel lanes, you could have kind of short-term delays, um, but generally the, the, the street would operate similar to, to as it does today for somebody driving down the street or riding a bus. Um, so there's two kind of key locations on Mass Ave, uh, both in the northbound direction, um, where we do need to remove a travel lane in order to create the space necessary to install a separated bicycle lane. The first of them is at the intersection of Walden Street. Um, today we have a left turn lane and two travel lanes, the right hand lane being right up against the curb. Um, so in order to install a separated bike lane at that location, we would have to remove that right hand travel lane. Um, and what we see 
in the analysis is we'd actually increase the delay for northbound traffic to roughly six times the existing conditions. So that's about two and a half extra minutes per vehicle. Um, and the queues go up to about five times of the existing conditions, which actually sends um, queues back through Porter Square and will block multiple adjacent intersections, which can create kind of safety concerns and you know issues on cross streets with people blocking crosswalks, blocking intersections, and kind of other undesirable behavior. The other location where we have kind of a similar um, issue with the, a lack of space for additional bicycle lane is uh, uh, coming up to Johnson Gate. Uh, just coming out of Harvard Square in the northbound direction. Um, so today we have uh, two vehicle travel lanes and then a, a narrow uh, striped bicycle lane. In order to create the separation for a separated bike lane, we would need to remove one of those travel lanes. Um, the impacts are fairly similar to what we saw at Walden Street, so roughly five times or two minutes uh, more for the existing delay and um, queues increasing by about quadruple of what they are today. And especially at this location with the new configuration recently installed as part of those Harvard Square safety improvements, that's going to mean that the queues from the signal at Johnson Gate are going to be extending back across the very large, very busy crosswalks in the heart of Harvard Square, uh, both on Mass Ave and headed back towards JFK and, and Brattle Streets. Hi, this is Kathy Watkins, City Engineer. I'm going to focus a little bit now on the analysis that we did and some um, the information we really learned about the overhead catenary wires. So I don't know who's clicking at that show. Thank you. So this is really focused on those same two sections, the A and B, the sort of outer mass ave sections. And you know, I think folks know that there's a 600 volt catenary wire system that runs the electric buses. Um, and that's a critical part of the electric bus system, but it does provide some significant challenges and understanding that the catenary system is owned completely by the MBTA, so it's not city infrastructure. And one of the things that really became clear was the impacts on fire access. So when the fire department goes to go fight a fire and wants to access buildings, operating that ladder is really critical. And so on a typical street, they have a lot of space to do that. They can up, look, raise and lower the ladder um, pretty much at will and can get access to the buildings. So this is an image on Mass Ave. This is right at Marathon Sports. And so this is how the fire department sets up on Mass Ave underneath the catenary wire system. So what they do today is that they pull as close as they can over to that parked vehicle into the bike lane, effectively shut down Mass Ave, but that allows them to get underneath the catenary system. And so you can see the ladder is completely to the left of the overhead wires and so that they can raise and lower the ladder truck and reach every different level of the building. And so that's sort of how they operate today. So then we looked at, well, how would they operate if we did sort of uh, the floating parking? So if you had protected bike lane next to the curb and then you had floating parking and then you had a travel lane, what would that mean for fire access? And so the fire department would be all the way over towards the median. They could raise the ladder truck over top of the catenary wires, as you've seen here today in this image. And so they could reach the upper levels, but they can't reach sort of the levels three, four, and five with the ladder truck. And so this does not work for them in terms of access to the building. Um, so they can go over it, but they can't sort of go through the wires. Um, they're generally looking to stay 10 feet away from the wires in terms of safety. And so they would not be able to access the levels three, four, and five. Thanks. Um, so we understand a lot more. What we also know about these two sections is that they're really complicated. So Joe talked about, um, you know, the, the study of really looking at the impacts of the quick build. What we know is that the catenary wires really impact what our options are. And it's a little less clear than quick build versus construction. And so we really need to spend more time. And this is part of what we'll be doing over the next year is looking at um, what are the construction opportunities in this section, as well as having more discussion with the MBTA about what, if any, are the options around the catenary. Um, so it's not exactly clear that just moving the catenary out into the middle lane, if that was feasible and possible, and um, we could work that out with the MBTA, does not address getting access back and forth to bus stops. So it's a fairly complicated system. So our, our goal is really over the next year, consistent with the um, the ordinance is to look much more deeply at what the construction potential are and more details on 
the catenary. Go ahead. And now I just want to talk a little bit about the two sections right in Harvard Square. And so I think this we have a much more a better understanding of what those two sections, the opportunities are. So again, these have always been identified as extremely difficult in terms of the key bus stop operations and that you really can have an effective um, bike facility with that heavy bus stop um, with through quick build. And so we know that we need to do a floating bus stop and really provide safe, accessible sidewalks, bus operation, and also a protected bike lane. So the next slide. And so this is an image of what that would look like. This is an image from Western Avenue. And so what we are looking for is coming back to the council with a construction timeline and are looking to really include this section in Harvard Square as part of the FY23 and FY24 five-year plan and through the city's capital planning to be able to do construction so that we can really address this, these two segments um, in a way that really works. Um, the other thing we wanted to do is just really quickly talk a little bit about, um, you know, construction. So we've talked about um, there's some pieces that we need to move forward with with construction. Um, and so I think we've talked about this before is that, you know, construction provides a lot of opportunities to provide, you know, high quality bike facilities and also a lot of other amenities and improvements. So pedestrian improvements, addressing the street paving issues, um, improve stormwater management, and really provide significant opportunities to proceed with some construction. Next slide. Um, so I think I, I locked up for a second. We also know that construction can cost significant amounts of money. So we can be talking 2 million, 20 million, 200 million, depending on what the scope of the project is. And so it's important as we look at um, prioritizing construction projects that it's really done through the five-year plan, as well as through the city's overall capital planning. Next. Um, and one of the reasons we really Think about that when we look at some of our larger projects like River Street, Western Ave, um, upcoming work right in Central Square, a lot of that work is coordinated with our heavy utility projects because it's really an opportunity to make significant improvements to our infrastructure. So both sewer, drain, and water um, city infrastructure and really improve um, how those utilities work for the community and provide better services, improve water quality, really looking at improving continue to make improvements to the water quality of the Charles River and have a much more comprehensive approach. Next slide. And then as we start to look at some of these pieces, one of the things I just really want to emphasize is that it can be difficult to do a little construction. So I know sometimes we'll talk about, oh, can't we make this improvement here or make this improvement there? And it's really important as we look at construction that we think about what is the overall impact of that construction. And so that can be very challenging when you're looking at existing utilities. This is a photo from Cardinal Madeiras. And so if you think, oh, if this was a location where we wanted to do a little bit of construction, such as put in a catch basin, it can be very difficult to do that because you're gonna run into a lot of utility conflicts. And so the scope of the project can grow quite significantly. Next. The other thing we have in terms of scoping projects, and this is where we really need to get into the, the details of what's possible in terms of construction and what does the scope of construction really look like is what are the existing utilities. So if we think about a street that has a you know 100 year old plus water main or gas main and we're doing construction in and around those, then we really want to be looking at upgrading that infrastructure as well. So from the water perspective, it's the right thing to do. From a gas perspective, it's also a legal requirement under state law that if we come within a certain distance of older cast iron gas mains that we need to be working with the gas company to replace those. And then we just want to touch on really quickly sort of um, other priorities that we're looking for as we're thinking about the sort of public space and right of way. So think a little bit about trees, transit and outdoor dining. Um, so with trees, one of the things, the image on the left is an image from the five-year plan and the urban forestry master plan that shows priorities for tree plantings and also identifies cool corridors, which are the black lines sort of running, you know, across the, sh the city. And what you see is that those overlap very closely with the bike priority lanes. And, the, and that makes sense because that's where people are, right? It's where people are walking, it's where people are biking, 
many of the streets are where people are waiting for buses. And so those are really key priorities in terms of street trees and providing cooling, cooler streets for people to sort of walk and bike and enjoy. Next. Um, this is an image, hopefully people have seen this before. It just really highlights the importance of tree canopy on how streets feel. And so on a typical 90 degree day, um, if you have pretty much minimal um, tree canopy, that street is gonna feel like 98 degrees if you're walking or biking along that street. If you can get the tree canopy up to 60%, it's gonna feel like 88 degrees. So there can be sort of a 10 degree difference in how the, those streets feel. And so it can be a really significant benefit. Next. Um, now I'm gonna turn it over to Brooke, who's gonna run through some information about transit and then also outdoor dining. Great, thank you, Kathy. Um, so anytime we're redesigning a street, we definitely need to consider what the impacts are gonna be on transit. So one of the ways that we look to do this is that we've um, studied locations of delay and unreliability, unreliability for bus riders across the city, specifically um, our colleagues at CDD have done this work. Um, and when we talk about this type of research, we talk about delay and you know, delay is very common and something you think of when you're on the bus, how much delay am I gonna have? But really reliability is another factor that has proven to be just as important as delay because you know, if you're someone who relies on, on, on buses for your, um, for your commute to work every day and one day it takes you half an hour and the next day it takes you an hour and a half, that's not a reliable transportation system that you can, um, that you can, re that you can rely on. So we look at both delay and um, reliability numbers. And while this work was done prior to COVID, you know, we don't believe that given the street network in Cambridge that these delay locations will be any different as um, traffic and uh, use of transit goes back up as we um, re uh, resume more travel. Um, so what we've done is we've looked at this information so that we can identify places for uh, bus priority. That's either dedicated bus lanes, um, transit priority signals, queue jumps, things like that. Um, and generally speaking, across the city, the places where we see the most unreliability and delay are Mouth Ave north of Harvard Square, uh, the crossings of the river, and around the Red Line stations. Let me go to the next one. Um, so in the morning in the section of Mouth Ave that we're talking about today, you can see in red um, in both directions, kind of at the very northern end of, of Mouth Ave near the Arlington line, you see severe delay, but really delay um, all the way along back towards Harvard Square um, at different points in both directions. And, and you can go to the next slide. And then in the PM, we see similar um, and even worse delays, uh, particularly heading out towards Arlington, um, both uh, and then also approaching Harvard Square. But the red really signalized pretty significant um, delay. So as we talk about changing um, our street layouts and we talk about delay for vehicles, we always have to think that that delay is also uh, affecting transit and kind of the multiplier effect that while delay for a vehicle is for one, two, three people, delay for a bus can be for 50 or 60 people. And just keeping that in mind. And then the final kind of other consideration, um, you know, outdoor dining since the pandemic has become very popular. We, we hear from the public and from restaurant owners um, how much they wanna see this uh, continue. And when we think about the multiple demands on the street, you know, street width is kind of always the limiting factor. Um, and, but, you know, we do see really good opportunity for, for separated bike lanes and outdoor dining to coexist. Um, you know, where we have room for floating parking, we have room, um, we typically would have room for dining. So if you can move to the next slide, um, you can see here just a sample of what something like this could look like where we're able to share um, kind of what could be the parking lane between, um, you know, dining at the curb and then a separated bike lane to the outside of the dining. So this is something that, you know, it's, it's always gonna be a case by case basis based on street width, um, but, you know, we do see good opportunities for this as well as we move forward. And I will hand it back over to Joe as we talk about next steps. Sure, thanks everyone. Um, so very quickly, um, and then we're, we'll be done is just to talk about next steps. Um, as I've alluded to a few times, uh, by next April, we have to come to agreement um, with the council uh, on, you know, 
particularly anywhere where we do need to do construction. So for example, those locations in Harvard Square that Kathy mentioned, where I think we 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 do recommend or, or do say that we need to do construction, we need to you know work with the council um, throughout these these locations to figure out a construction timeline or figure out if if these can be done as quick build. Uh, and then uh, for anything that is going to be quick build, if, if, if anything is selected for that method, then those have to be done by April 30th of 2023. Um, uh, whereas anything that is construction will have worked out that timeline. So that's a timeline that will that, that is still to come. Uh, and then if for some reason we cannot agree on a construction timeline, or we do not get approval from the council, um, by April 30th of 2024, we would have to install quick build separated bike lanes on all of these segments. And so basically that's a kind of, you know, end result that I don't think really anyone wants. Um, but if we can't agree to that construction timeline by, by next April, then, then we have two years from that point to put in separated bike lanes that are quick build. Um, and so that, that, like I said, that's not the outcome we're looking for. And I don't think it's the outcome anyone else is looking for, but that is kind of the, the end result if, if that agreement isn't forthcoming. Um, and then obviously, like I said, if we do agree to a construction timeline to be determined on those segments that require construction, then that the, 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 the due dates will be part of that agreement and we'll have that information available at the time that that agreement is put together. So I think it's really important just to end by saying we recognize that there's an ongoing series of conversations with the community, with you know stakeholders in general, the council specifically, uh, local residents along these segments to figure out, okay, what are we actually going to be doing uh, and, and actually come up with the best plan we can for putting in separated bike lanes, uh, balancing impact and schedule and safety and all the other factors that we have to take into account along with all the considerations that Kathy and, and Brooke mentioned uh, as, as well as probably many others. Um, and so, you know, that's our task between now uh, and April 30th of 2022 is to figure out the actual plan. Again, this was not the actual plan. This is just sort of a, a starting point for those conversations. Uh, and so people can understand what it would look like if we were to do uh, sort of typical quick build along the, along these these segments. Um, so with that, I will turn it back to you, Councillor, uh, and what, whatever the comes next. Thank you, and uh, thank you to the city staff for that presentation uh, and for all of your work on this. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, we're going to go now to a group of residents who include uh, local business owners uh, and safe streets advocates. Um, they include Ruth Riles, uh, Jean Oster, uh, Catherine Beatty, uh, Stephen Boucher, and Janie Katz-Curtis. Um, they have a, a PowerPoint presentation, uh, and I'm going to share it on my screen. Uh, and if folks can just say uh, next slide, uh, we can go through it. Um, so we'll do that now. Great, and then uh, I will turn it over to Ruth, who I think is going to start. Yes, can you hear me? We can. Very good. Um, we're calling this North Ave North Mass Avenue roadway. <laughs> roadway is kind of a significant term here because I think one of our problems is that the street as it currently exists. And when I hear Joe Barr and the traffic department, I'm a little worried about the emphasis on getting vehicles through here, cars and trucks. And the reaction of a lot of the people you're going to hear from shortly is that we need to actually to step back and try to have a genuine design that features the length of this street from Harvard Square out to Dudley as a series of neighborhoods with a lot of very unique shops, um, retail shops, dining shops, uh, the kind of places that we have all thought of the section of Cambridge that we think of when we look at this section of Cambridge. If you go to the next slide. Um, just by way of introduction, and I'll ask each of the people when they begin to speak to introduce themselves, but it's a, a wide range of business owners uh, bike safety committee people um, and 
the PSNA, which I'm the president of, but in comes right out of our presentation and our work in trying to form a working group to look at this and work with the city on it is comes out of a committee meeting or a PSNA meeting we had in May where we looked at what the city had dropped as the some refer to it as a plan but at least the report um, which scared a lot of people especially a lot of business owners because it basically said this is what happens if you take away if you put the, the quick build bike lane all along that section of the avenue that in essence you wipe out all business parking um, and you wipe out loading zones and you would have a terrible impact of course on the economy of some very significantly already struggling small businesses who've been through COVID and uh, trying to come back up again. Um, but I also want to stress that it's a bigger meeting and a bigger community than that. The CLF, the Cambridge Local First Converse City Conversations or Community Conversations tomorrow will be discussing the same topic. Um, and we want to be talking to residents and truly looking at a way in which we can work with the city to look at each if not block by block, but at least segment by segment, so that we know the character and what are the possibilities to make this, I'll emphasize again, not just a through way that we're looking at, how fast can we get cars and trucks through here in four lanes, but how can we recognize that this is a city neighborhood? This is in fact our community center running through it and we need to make it more welcoming, more tree-lined, more planted, more art. Um, we want to look at a lot of design possibilities, including the taking down of the crumbling and ugly median, putting in its place islands at places, putting in more crosswalks, putting in places for pedestrians to feel safe, perhaps art or paintings along uh, uh, if you have a, a I, I will use the wrong term here, but not a ballard, but a, if you have a post there, you could have it you know, almost a, a, um, a project by Leslie students to keep them painted. Um, but we will be having a conversation and we hope that the city will have that conversation with us about how to change the character of the roadway and not give so much emphasis in this section of Mass Avenue to just moving cars and trucks through, including the potential of narrowing the number of traffic lanes. Um, and we also wanna make sure that the buses are moving through here more reliably. The, I'll just make one further point here and that uh, some of this, um, and my history with it goes back to a group called Mass Avenue Improvement Committee, where we tried, we worked with the city, I think pretty successfully over a number of years to improve the streetscape of Mass Avenue from Harvard to Upland. And we had scored sidewalks and the brick edging and much larger sea, uh, uh, street tree wells and much bigger caliper trees planted. And that section is better now better feel to it. We also put in place at um, Shepherd Street and Mass Avenue and also um, in front of Invivia, we put in planted and seating arrangements. We were trying again to make the avenue much more welcoming and much more of the kind of place we're also comfortable biking, walking or going and parking to go to our favorite businesses, retail shops, restaurants. And we look forward to working with the city to continue that kind of planning. Next slide, please. In essence, what we want, the whole working group, and the, as I emphasize, we come from very different segments, business owners and bicyclists and vehicle drivers, pedestrians, neighbors. We wanna promote a, a vibrant and thriving business area it's designed to draw shoppers, diners, and other customers to the area so they can experience a, a variety of offerings. 
and that they look at it as we do as a community center. We want to solve the urgent bicycle safety problem on Mass Avenue. Nobody wants any more bicyclists killed. Um, we want to improve the reliability and speed for bus riders because the more we can reduce the car traffic, the better we're all going to be. And we want to create a safe and friendly pedestrian experience throughout. And one way we do that, of course, is having more crosswalks and safer crosswalks. And we look forward to working with the city contextually, looking at a block by block or blocks by blocks and in close coordination with the community to try and find solutions that achieve our goals as well. Next slide. And at that, this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Jeannie uh, Oster, who's the owner of Guitar Stop and uh, this Guitar Stop. And she will tell you a little bit about the response she's had from businesses on the report that the city traffic department dropped. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yes, yeah, so I own Guitar Stop. Uh, it was originally started by my father in 1962. Uh, the picture up on the on the side there with all of us was on our 50th anniversary and my brother and my nephew and myself and then my sister Annette is to my right or left, whatever. Anyways, so uh, we were, my dad started the store in 62. We were in Central Square until 87. And then we've been in a relatively the same area for the last 34 years. And um, I was not aware of, of this uh, bicycle plan until Ruth had sent out an email a couple of weeks ago. And when I looked at the plan, the impact study, I'm sorry, it's not a plan, it's an impact study. It did not mention economic study at all. It, it didn't take into consideration how harmful it would be to the location, the stores located from Harvard Square to Dudley Street. There's a, every, um, where I was not aware of it, I thought my sister and I wrote up flyers and we went handing it out to different stores and the reactions we got were first, I'm going, I have to move, are you joking? Um, I'm, I'm going to be out of business if they remove all the parking. There's not enough parking as there is right now. And the majority of our customers, you know, we do have people who walk in, we have people who bike in, but they'll, I have customers just yesterday who walked into the store, dropped off a guitar, and then it's like, well, I have to come back with my car to pick it up. That happens all the time. Or they have customers that go by the store and they said, oh, I found a parking space. I've been going by your store for months and I haven't been able to stop, so I haven't shopped here. And to, to um, vote in this ordinance in 2020 without contacting the businesses, having an input on the businesses to see how devastating it would be to not have parking. We want bicyclists to be safe, but we don't want to kill our businesses in the meantime. And we don't have any other alternative to, to uh, replace the service of the customers. It used to be, well, you could sell online, but now Amazon kills the online business. If people can't park, they're just going to order online. It's more convenient. Grubhub kills the restaurant build business. It's, um, and then the other thing I wanted to point out that people have said to me is they have signed leases. They have a 10-year lease, and the lease they signed said that it had parking in front, and that's why they changed that, picked that location and signed that 10-year lease. If they don't have the parking, then they're going to end up suing the city for taking away their parking and ruining their business. Um, they said they had 90% of their business drives in for it. We have customers from all over not just people who can walk or bike. And even the people who can walk and bike say, well, we'll be back. We, we, we got to get our car to pick this up. Um, you know, it's just a very frustrating that after we go through a year and a half of having store closing, uh, we're not getting inventory delivered because of, of the pandemic, then it's like, okay, now we're going to take away your parking. Good luck to you. So it's, 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 I can't stress enough how devastating it would be to all the small businesses up and down the street. Um, in some other locations in Cambridge, they have 
parking lots that you can park. And, and then I've also heard, oh, this happened to me in Inman Square. I woke up one day and all our parking was gone. So it's, it's really a huge problem and it's very upsetting to me and to the, everyone that I spoke to. And we went up and down the street from Harvard Square to Dudley on both sides of the street, my sister, myself, and my nephew handing out flyers and the people were not aware. They couldn't believe that they're doing this to them. So many stores have gone out already because of the pandemic and we should be supporting the stores, not killing them. And I guess, I think that hit everything that I wanted I to go. about your petition. How many of them you oh, have? So we started a petition just two weeks ago, just after Memorial Day. And we had, and just in my store, we had 18 pages of signatures and then 58 signatures online. And that was just in my store because when we went up and down the street, we handed out flyers telling them about this meeting. And we also handed out petitions for people to sign it and send back in. And whether they do that or not is possible. <laughs> Was that everything, Ruth? Did I cover everything? You did. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I think from a business standpoint, it's also important to note that whatever you do in terms of construction, you've got to think about the retail businesses and across the board, their single biggest time of trying to make some money back will be fall and Christmas. Thank you. Um, so we need to make sure that you keep that in mind. Uh, I know that they practically sieged, laid siege to the traffic department once before when they tried to do some construction right in the fall as they were beginning to uh, ramp up sales toward Christmas. Next slide. And oh, we got that. Well Oh, excuse me, Catherine, you want to just go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, Stephen, who's the owner of Ward Maps, you want to introduce uh, yourself as well? Yeah, I will, I'll go first and Steve will join us on, Stephen will join us on the next slide. Um, hello, my name is Catherine Beatty. I live in North Cambridge and I commute with my three children by bicycle to Davis Square um, to drop my twins off in, um, at daycare. And then I go to public school to drop off my son on Range before traveling down Mass Ave to work in Harvard Square. I'm very familiar with this stretch of road and the challenges faced by cyclists. My partner was hit by a motor vehicle who was turning right over him to go to the gas station on Walden. I am volunteering with Cambridge Bicycle Safety because I want to make Cambridge a place that my children can safely explore on their own, on foot or on bicycle when they're old enough and not in decades from now when they're adults. It's unfortunate that the city's impact analysis implied that the only way to add separated bike lanes to North Mass Ave is to eliminate all parking. While the analysis of impacts was done block by block, the application of one single design to every block ignores the, the varying abutting land use and community preferences. The city's analysis did not consider more context sensitive designs that change block to block and even within blocks as they have done in other projects. There are in fact quick build options illustrated in the diagram here that would work along Mass Ave by utilizing a menu of options such as creating a single travel lane with left turn lanes where needed, dedicated bus lanes at traffic lights, and creating additional parking or loading zones for businesses on side streets. It is critical to all of us that the city considers such context sensitive designs, design options moving forward. Um, next slide. So in addition, we feel the city should consider removing the median, which would provide the necessary space to allow for protected bicycle lanes, a parking lane, two lanes of vehicular traffic in both directions of Mass Ave, which you can see here in this cross section. If changes to the median are pursued, this need, um, this, these needs, one second. If changes to the mediums are per pursued, this um, would happen, this should happen with minimal lightweight construction project as the city recently did on Denny Street, not a lengthy full depth reconstruction. 
For both bicycle safety and businesses, a lengthy construction project is not a viable option. And now I'd like to pass it to Stephen. My name is Stephen Boche. Everyone can hear me good? Yep. Yep. So uh, I own Ward Maps and MBTA Gifts right in the middle of the avenue between uh, Cambridge Common and, and Porter Square. Uh, I've had my retail business there about 10 years. I've also been a neighborhood uh, resident of Agassiz. I've been there about 18 years with my wife. Uh, so I see the avenue from very uh, a lot of perspectives. I bike on it, I drive on it, I park on it, I walk on it, I tee on it. Um, I use it for my business, so it's my livelihood, I, but I'm also a resident of the neighborhood. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I have a vested interest, like many of us do, in the avenue from many perspectives. Um, I like you know, what Mr. Barr mentioned, that he described this as uh, the, you know, the center or the spine of Cambridge. If that's really what it is, then what it is right now is essentially a, a poorly designed highway uh, that is dangerous for many of us. Uh, many of us walking, biking, even driving. Um, I've been hit by, I've been riding my bike through Inman Square and I was hit by a car there. Um, so we've all had those experiences. We know the failings of this roadway. And as a business owner, I'm 100% in support of a protected bike lane. I am not in support of removing the ability for people to park. Um, when we think of a complete street, we think of something like in this diagram where there's travel lanes, there's parking lanes, there's protected bike lanes, there's sidewalk canopy over a really nice sidewalk. I feel as if this is the opportunity for Cambridge and all of us to uh, continue our collaboration, which is towards, I think, the same goal, a better avenue, a real avenue, a city center, um, not a high speed, dangerous corridor. Um, and yeah, so um, that's my thoughts for that. Uh, next slide. Stephen, you might just point out that how much of your traffic of your customer base actually drives in from quite a ways out mm -hmm. and picks up heavy things. Yep, so I have a local, and thank you to everyone who shops with us locally, but I also have an international audience. And before COVID, I had people who would uh, fly to Logan, they would take the T or they'd rent a car and they'd come to my shop because we do some things that you can't get anywhere else. Um, part of the reason why I opened my business in Cambridge was because of Cambridge being a place where you can often, and sadly, less and less so, find something that you can't get anywhere else, sometimes in the world. Uh, and Parking is vital to my retail business. You cannot take a 200 pound MBTA sign that, that I sell and take it on the bus or on your bike. But with that said, every day I watch someone tie up their bike in front of my shop and they come in. Uh, people come in with their bike helmets all the time. It's how I shop too in Cambridge. So I wanna have that, that place for the bike to be there safely, but I also want to have a parking space for that customer of mine uh, who arrives by car. I think the avenue has a lot of width. As these diagrams start to get into, there's a lot of width here. Get rid of that median. You can't drive on the median. You can't park on the median. You can't safely bike or walk on the median. Let's use that real estate for something better. Was that a challenge, um, Stephen? I can, uh, is that 200 pounds by bicycle? I'll, I'm gonna work on that. Okay. <laughs> okay, yes. certain sections. <laughs> Certain sections of North Mass Ave could be fitted with priority bus lanes, especially leading up to traffic lights to allow queue jumping. By prioritizing public transit and creating safe conditions for cyclists, the city would encourage more people to make the modal shift to more sustainable forms of transportation and ultimately make our city more livable. And along Mass Ave, create a desirable destination, not just a traffic thoroughfare. Stephen? Yeah, and I think there's more opportunities beyond the perimeter of the avenue. Um, I know we're, we're going to get into some more intense studies, uh, uh, like the city has mentioned, and that's great. Um, but if, if let's just say that all the parking is removed, that's an area that I'm uh, keenly interested in. Uh, if that remo is removed from the avenue, then perhaps some of the uh, first blo uh, block or so, or first few parking spaces of each side street can be turned into uh, public parking that's during the daytime. 
And then at night, it reverts back to permit parking. That happens in the South End in Boston. Um, it's a good balance if you need to make roadway improvements to make it safer, but you can't fit parking on the street. Um, also, as uh, Gene from Guitar, Guitar Stop mentioned, we have no municipal parking lots in this section of Cambridge. So Central Square, even if you, they got rid of all the uh, street parking, which they didn't, there's still meters in Central Square. Central Square is blessed with a couple municipal lots, even a garage. We have no alternative. And as a business owner, um, I support bike safety, I support road safety, transit, we gotta get everything going. But if you take away the parking, you essentially take away what makes the avenue interesting, a lot of the independent businesses. And I, I don't think the city of Cambridge is proposing a par public parking garage. Um, I, I'm not proposing that, but um, yeah, the, the parking has to be part of the, uh, has to be part of a complete street. Next one. Just one point, Stephen. Um, even if we did the, some commercial parking on the side, on the, some of the residential streets during the day, that doesn't actually help one segment of the businesses. That is the uh, restaurant trade People like Julia, for example, who rely on an evening, they don't even open until five o'clock. So they aren't present in our presentation, but I wanted to speak up and say that they have to be con considered as well. And, and so just, um, probably just want to jump in and know we're uh, past six, and I know at least one committee member has to run it at seven. Um, so I think there's, there's one other presenter, but if we can try to, to wrap it up, we still have public comment and the, the council piece. Okay. Go ahead, Stephen, wrap it up. <laughs> um, you could go to the next slide, I'm good, thank you. Okay, and the median does create a refuge point for pedestrians attempting to cross four lanes of fast moving traffic. One benefit of adding parking protected bicycle lanes is that it effectively sh shortens the distance people need to travel to cross the road by creating pedestrian islands as sort of refuges at the ends of the parking lanes, as you can see in the top image on the right. At certain crosswalks, such as at Garfield Street, a center refuge island could be created, as you see an example on the bottom, and the cross section is, is demonstrating that as well here. Stephen? Thank you, Catherine. I'm good uh, for expedition. We'll go to the next slide. And I can just wrap it up here by saying we'd like the city to consider using some of the following tools, and there are many more, allow the businesses to expand the street parking area, into the street parking areas. Everyone has fallen in love with outdoor dining, and it has certainly helped the bottom line of a lot of our din uh, restaurants. Uh, use the side streets for commercial use during the business hours, uh, which we've mentioned provide more crosswalks and raised crosswalks to slow traffic integrate community art by introducing some art designs on the segment that you, or whatever you replace segments of the median with, uh, eliminate the median in some places while maintaining it in others. And I would say rebuilding it as islands, not maintaining it as it exists because it's quite ugly and deteriorating. Put the avenue, and lastly, I think we seriously need to put the avenue on a road diet narrow where we can, traffic lanes, slow down some of the speeding traffic. All of us who work and eat and along that avenue know that we have some people who go great speeds up and down the avenue. And most importantly of all, simply work with us because we know our local businesses, our local neighborhoods, and it's gotta work for all of us. Thank you very much. There's one more slide. One more slide. I'm sorry, Judy, Janie, go ahead. Hi, um, I am Janie Katz Christie, and I live in Porter Square. I have for about 40 years now plus. Um, my husband and I, along with our now, um, our three now 20 something children, um, young adults uh, bike, as well as walk and use transit extensively throughout Cambridge for transportation and shopping and everything. Um, which we've done for our children's whole lives and long before them. So I know this area very well. I feel like I'm a generation ahead of um, Catherine. But um, so I've been watching this for a long time. So in closing our presentation, 
I want to emphasize that we need to make sure that the business's interests um, and needs are addressed, along with the very, very, as um, Councillor Sabrina Wheeler uh, introduced this, the urgent need to prevent more deaths on our streets. None of us want lengthy construction periods, which will harm businesses um, and delay safe infrastructure. Um, our roads are extremely hazardous for cyclists and pedestrians. This map, which is a little hard to see on the left, um, shows just the reported crashes between motor vehicles and bikes or pedestrians. And we know that this is just the tip of the iceberg because most crashes are not reported, even those that have had terrible impacts on victims. Um, our, our city's walkability and bikeability are among our greatest assets. And the city wisely promotes, uh, the, promotes that for many reasons, including environmental and economic sustainability. And we don't want residents, visitors, or employees to be driving more Respondents to all sorts of surveys, um, including current cyclists, people who want to bike or are related to those who want to, to bike, beg literally for more bike infrastructure. Um, so it is morally imperative that we provide as soon as possible infrastructure to keep our more vulnerable users safe in doing what we all want and need for them to do. So I think that together, all of us who have just spoken are urging the city to find a way to do the right design in this area in both the short and long term to keep us safe, keep our children safe, keep our parents safe, and to enable our businesses to thrive. Um, thank you. Great, thank you. I'm gonna um, stop sharing the screen. Um, we have uh, thrown out a public comment. Um, those were the folks that uh, can mute um, if they're not speaking. Um, uh, those were great presentations from uh, city staff and from residents. Um, they um, did take out a bit of uh, time. Um, and I think we have 11 folks signed up for public comment. Uh, so I'm just gonna ask if we can limit public comment uh, to one uh, minute each. So we have time for council questions uh, and discussion. Um, Mr. Clerk, do we need a motion for that or is that the, at the discretion of the chair? Uh, we'll need a motion. You, the chair can make the motion. Great. Um, I'll accept a motion um, from Councilor Nolan um, to limit uh, public comment to one minute. On limiting public comment to one minute. Vice Mayor Mallon. No. No, Councilor Nolan. Yes. Yes, Councilor Toomey, absent. Councilor Zondervan. Yeah. Councilor Zondervan. No. No, Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. Yes. Yes, motion fails. Two in favor, two against, and one absent. Uh -huh. In that case, um, we'll have three minutes for, for public comment, uh, as is the norm. Um, Mr. Clerk, um, if you could um, start with uh, the public comment. The first person signed up for public public comment is Jean Oster. Um, Jean was one Jean, of the, the yeah, I was one yeah. of the speakers, so, so I, I'll give up my time. Although I do want to say that we get customers, international customers, local customers from all over, and they are coming specifically to our store. But I'll give up the rest of my time. Thank you. The next speaker is Tim Keith. Tim, uh, please go ahead if you're on the, the Zoom. Tim Keefe did reach out to say that he would be listening but not able to speak tonight. So we can go to the next person. The next speaker is Albert Duart. Albert, please go ahead if you are on the Zoom. Albert Duarte, you are unmuted and you do have the floor. Please go ahead. Uh, 
he appears to be having some technical difficulties. I see that he's unmuted, but I do not hear any sound. The next speaker is Christopher Casa. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for all the, the great work on this plan. Um, I just want to speak as a person who uses businesses in that zone. In fact, my, my first car insurance a long time ago was at Guitar Stop that I purchased ever. Um, but I also bike and really feel the urgent need for the upgrades on, on Mass Ave. Um, it's just a very, very dangerous place to walk through or bike through right now, especially as you get toward uh, Porter Square and those stretches uh, that you've discussed through Harvard. Um, I'm really, really happy to see that, um, you know, in a natural setting, people are able to kind of come to an agreement about reasonable solutions. So it's just so happy. I'm, I'm really just happy to see that Jeevan and, uh, and other counselors were able to put this together with Ruth. And to echo what Ruth said, um, please, this is, we can't just be looking at this as a way to push more vehicles through this road. It has to be a place for people to want to go to use the businesses to get there safely. I hope everyone has a great day. The next speaker is Rebecca Newman. Hi, um, I'm Rebecca. I am like, like many other people that have spoken tonight, I'm a biker, but I'm also a pedestrian, a user of public transportation. Um, I live on Concord Ave, pretty close to High Rise. So I'm on Mass Ave pretty much all the time. Um, I just want to say, like, I think a lot of other people have said how important this street is for Cambridge. Um, and, you know, how important it is for me that it be safe for biking. I think, I know I'm constantly on high alert, both because of the risk of, of car drivers opening their door into the bike lane. Um, and also, you know, there's quite a few Ubers and Lyfts on Mass Ave that are constantly going in and out of the bike lane. So I think making sure that it's separated um, is super important. Sadly, like a lot of other people have said on this call, I've also been hit while biking. Um, it's unfortunate that that's such a common occurrence. Um, I totally agree with what uh, Steven and Jean have uh, have mentioned as far as the need for parking in certain areas along Mass Ave or on side streets. I do wanna mention that the intercept survey that um, the CDD did a couple of years ago showed that the vast majority of shoppers coming to Porter Square did not come by car. Um, so I am very hopeful um, based on what has been talked about in this meeting that we can find a solution that makes the street safe for me um, but also for bikers of all ages and abilities and all the people that would like to bike but feel like they can't because it's just not safe enough. Um, I hope we can find a solution that allows for parking where needed, um, that allows for loading and drop off zones, that makes sure that the bus is still um, efficient for people. So I really hope that we can find a solution that does all of those things and I hope that we can do it, you know, sooner rather than later so that Catherine's kids can um, be biking when they're old enough. Yeah, thank you. The next speaker, Amy Kitt. Hi, I've lived in Cambridge for 40 years and um, I've never, I've never even had a desire to bike here because of the, uh, because I think it's dangerous. Um, although I know steps have been taken. I was really relieved to hear at the beginning of this meeting that the plan by the city was not a, a, a final actual plan because it's so complicated and it's so heartbreaking um, that our, to see what the disregard for our small businesses in that plan. We need to keep, we need to support our small businesses and um, we need to keep the parking. And I actually, um, the, the gentleman who owns the map store presented an overview of schematic alternatives too, which actually I thought was what I was going to propose anyway. It's, it, if you make anything too complicated, as has been done in some areas of Cambridge, people just stop 
and try to figure it out. It's it's very um, dangerous. But um, if you can widen the sidewalks and make it partially for pedestrians and half half for pedestrians, half for bicycles, as has been done on Upper Concord Avenue, um, I think that that would go a long way. You get rid of the median. You would have plenty of room for parking spaces and two lanes of traffic going each way. I really though, I really wanna urge you to strongly consider our small businesses um, and we need to support them. Thank you so much. The next speaker is Gleb Bamatov. Hi, thank you so much. I bike from Central Square where I work at Work Bar to Sherman and Huron. And my wife takes electrical scooter from home to her work in Somerville. But I know that every time I bike and if I take Mass Avenue, I know it's dangerous and I can die. I never take my son along this street because any mistake can be fatal. It is a weird street I find. It's heavy traffic, wide traffic lanes, and lots of lots of people biking, walking, and lots of suddenly opening car doors too. And I cannot believe there is no good solution to put a protected bike lane there. I think cycling would be better for the climate, better for the city, better for the people who want to move quickly, and even for people who want to dine at the curb. But we cannot just say that parts of Mass Avenue cannot be protected because of reasons. Just risk it and die it. Uh, die and ride. Uh, it's unfair to people, and it's even bad for traffic in our city because every cyclist means less traffic in front of you. And keeping things the same would not work in the future because the streets cannot scale infinitely if more people drive. Only public transportation and personal mobility devices like biking, walking, you know, scooters would solve the problem. If we keep doing what we're doing today, meaning prioritize cars and their own street parking, then the parking problem will solve itself. As all the major streets like Mass Ave will just turn into big parking lot during rush hours. And I'm really glad to hear that uh, uh, about cycling implementation progress update from the city management. I'm happy they communicated clearly that they intend to fully implement the changes. And I'm looking forward to biking the entire Mass Avenue in the future. Thank you. The next speaker is Mark Boswell. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Mark Boswell. I live uh, in the Porter Square neighborhood, and I get around primarily by bike. I do all of my errands, my shopping, most of it on Mass Ave uh, by bike. And uh, as anyone who's ridden it uh, knows, and as the previous commenters have said, uh, it's pretty terrifying and it needs change. I'm very encouraged by uh, Director Joe Barr's uh, supportive statements uh, about separated bike lane installations on Mass Ave. Um, and I would like to urge uh, the city council and staff uh, to remain committed to the timeline that is laid out by the cycling safety ordinance. And I'm, I'm also very glad that the ordinance has brought this discussion uh, before us now and that we're taking a very serious look at it. Uh, but uh, we need to uh, do what we can to keep on track with the implementation. I would very much like to see these changes made at some point within my lifetime. Um, I am, I continue to be a little surprised at the reaction of some business owners about uh, the customer activity in terms of cyclists. Um, many cyclists that I know are customers all over Cambridge and because they're on bikes, they're, they're very local uh, to where they're going. And uh, so the support there is strong and I, I, I hope that businesses are more aware of that. And I do appreciate Mr. Boucher's uh, comments about recognizing cyclists that come into a store. Uh, and also, as I talk to more uh, businesses and employee, employees, I realized that the workers commonly get to work by bike, so it's important for them too. Um, and I've seen the impact study that uh, was produced by city staff. I appreciate the effort that went into it. Uh, however, uh, I, I would like to see more flexibility in the proposal uh, that makes the avenue work better for all users, including people in transit, um, or walking, and providing some curb space for loading zones and retail parking. And I hope that tonight's discussion and other future discussions will explore those alternatives. Thanks. 
Next speaker is Ray Jones. Ray has not joined. Randy Stern, please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Randy Stern. I am a Cambridge Port resident and I cycle often along Mass Ave. My son lives in Davis Square, probably two or three times a week. I'm biking along Mass Ave and it, it's just incredibly unsafe. Um, and I really feel like protected bicycle lanes are um, the, the thing that will allow me to extend my life. Uh, I feel that every mile that I ride on a unprotected bike lane, I'm really putting myself at risk. And I think a lot of other people feel the same way. It's just incredibly urgent to, to meet the city's strategic goals for climate change, for safety, for vision zero, et cetera, by, by building these bike lanes. And um, I was really happy to see what the city staff presenting uh, more creative options uh, and, and thoughts about how to deal with Northern Mass Ave uh, rather than just putting in uh, the kind of bike lanes that would require eliminating all parking. So I, I really encourage the city to take that seriously and to come up with some plans that'll shrink the street, uh, make it more neighborly um, and do it quickly. I think urgency is, is important. Um, trying to meet the kind of time frame of in the next two or three years is really incredibly important. That's why the ordinance asked for it. Um, and I, I fully support the city in exploring options that will meet the kind of needs that the Porter Square Neighborhood Association outlined um, for, um, for a safer street for pedestrians, shoppers, cyclists, etc. cetera. So um, thank you. The next speaker is Julia Hansen. Hi, um, my name is Julia. Um, I've lived in the Cambridge and Somerville border area for seven years. Um, I only own a bike, um, so that's my main way of getting around um, for basically all year. Um, and I, the reason the reason I showed up at this particular meeting today and wanted to give a comment is that um, I, like others have said before, have been hit by a car while biking around our greater city. Um, but more specifically, only a couple weeks ago, I was biking up um, Mass Ave from Harvard to, uh, to Porter. And I was nearly crushed between a U-Haul and the parked cars um, simply because the U-Haul sort of dr drifted into the bike lane. And um, unfortunately, this is definitely not the first time it's happened to me. I know it happens to a lot of bikers and it's um, a, a huge reason that so many other people don't bike. So um, that, that specific uh, circumstance was what sort of prompted me to show up to, uh, today. But um, I was really encouraged to hear the support um, from uh, Mr. Barr at the beginning. And I think the Porter Square Neighbor Association um, had some great ideas. Um, I also think that supporting public transit is really, really important. And I would, um, I would love to see dedicated bus lanes as well as dedicated bike lanes all along Mass Ave because I think um, getting people out of their personal cars whenever possible um, is, is essential to having the city and the environment that we know we need in the next, um, well, starting now, but definitely over the next century. Um, I would really encourage the, um, uh, the city council and, and the traffic engineers in Cambridge to also include um, uh, predictions of traffic flow, um, not just how much, how many cars could queue up at once, but also what's, what would be the effect of having better biking infrastructure on the amount of traffic that we would see on the Mass Ave corridor. Um, so th that, that would be a, a suggestion for me for, for further presentations. Um, and, and finally, just wanted to re reiterate how important local businesses are. Um, I definitely, uh, my, my personal view is that, like I only wanna shop in local businesses when possible, and, but I do get there by bike. Um, so I think we heard a lot of ideas um, today that support more biking, more space dedicated to um, cyclists along Mass Ave, um, but without cutting off um, all parking, which as we've heard 
the, um, the businesses need. So that's it. Thank you so much. Next speaker is James Williamson. James does not appear to be in the Zoom. Um, we can go to Nathaniel Fillmore. Hello, do you hear me? <clears throat> okay, um, yeah, thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks to the city and also to everybody who spoke previously. I just wanted to briefly speak and talk about the, um, the report's analysis. I think there have been some good suggestions raised in regard to what can be done if it can be removed and the catenary wires for the bus are either removed or, or adjusted. Um, but, but I found the, the city's report frustrating for some of the reasons that Catherine mentioned in her, um, present, in her slides of the presentation. The city's report does not actually demonstrate that quick build is infeasible or has mega negative impacts. It demonstrates that you know, one or three specific straw man designs, uh, if applied uncritically and uniformly to the entire corridor, have those impacts and are potentially infeasible. Even though a block by block analysis of the chosen design alternative was done, the design itself is really naive and simplistic and not something that the city would realistically ever implement. In no other project has the city ever just like nuked all parking on a corridor or applied the same design to every block pretty much of the entire corridor. That would never be done. And a lot of the impacts that were discussed and the alternatives that were rejected would seem to be potentially mitigated with a more sophisticated and context sensitive design. Just a couple of examples. I don't believe that the city's traffic analysis included any new left turn lanes. So every time any individual driver wants to take a left turn, we all know what will happen, which is that they'll have to wait until the next yellow. And so an entire light cycle will be wasted, creating a backup. But there is space to have a left turn lane at, at key intersections. And only at that spot would you need to remove parking in order to make space for the left turn lane. Another example is with the fire trucks. The city's analysis of the, of, of the, alter, of the alternative with floating parking talks about how actually the fire trucks could drive into the bike lane and it does fit dimensionally, but their outriggers would need to rest on the sidewalk in order to provide support for the ladder to not tip over. And in places where the sidewalk is hollow because of historic storage under the sidewalks, like we used to store coal under there or something, then that could be dangerous where the sidewalk could collapse. But surely it's either known or knowable where the sidewalk is hollow. And I doubt that it's hollow in the majority of the corridor or even a significant minority of it. And so again, so in, in this case, so this, but, but that, that entire thing was rejected for the whole corridor because there might be places where the sidewalk is hollow and that would be dangerous. The solution would be obvious, which is to just not do floating parking where the sidewalk is hollow, but you could do floating parking where the sidewalk is not hollow. So it, it's, a, it's a bit frustrating that this sort of extreme straw man plan was dropped and freaked everybody out. And to me, it doesn't seem necessary. Thanks. Mr. Herc, is that all for public comment? We're going to try to go back to um, Albert Duart, Duarte. Albert, if you're on the Zoom, please uh, go ahead. Albert Duarte, you are um, unmuted if you wish to speak. Councilor Sabrina Wheeler, they have not unmuted themselves on their end, so perhaps they cannot or no longer wish to speak. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else for public comment, Mr. Clark? There's no one signed up. There's no one else signed up for public comment. Thank you. Um, we can go now to council questions and discussion, but I believe we first have to, to close public comment. Um, so on a motion from Councilor Zondervan, um, Mr. Clerk, could you take the roll? On that motion of close. Um, point, point of order, Mr. Chair, I believe we don't actually have to close public comment. We can just leave it open. Mr. Clerk, could you clarify? I couldn't hear. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. 
the question was whether we. Oh, sorry. I said that we don't have to close public comment. We can just leave it open. We can, yeah. Um, if we don't need to, it seems like we're, we're done. Um, so that makes sense. We can go right to, to council questions and uh, discussion. Um, uh, sorry, I missed the, I see three councillors with their hands up and I uh, missed the order. So um, apologies, we'll go first to, uh, to Vice Mayor Mallon and then to uh, Councillor Nolan. Uh, Councillor Nolan had her hand up first, so I'll yield to her. Thanks, is that okay, Chair? Yes, please, yeah. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I think we're close to simultaneous. I am so thrilled to be in this meeting. I appreciate um, all the presentations, the city presentation, and I particularly appreciate the groups of Cambridge Bike Safety, the Small Businesses, and Fortress Square Neighborhood Association coming together to really talk about the hard issues of how it is it that we can hold all of these needs together. And I think my, my question is, why wouldn't we follow that lead? Um, it seems to me that what was presented by the group of the small businesses and PSNA and Cambridge Bike Safety were exactly the kind of thinking that we need to address here. Several of the designs included everything that we have been asking for, which is protected bike lanes, the length of Mass Ave, helping small businesses by continuing to allow them to um, have their uh, loading zones, their parking. It would also allow for the continuation of the, um, the, the dining in the streets and the using of some of the street parking for, uh, for restaurants. I, I don't understand why we would not do everything we possibly can to do the quick builds everywhere we can. I also agree completely that the median should either be a completely redesigned tree well, just the entire length of Mass Ave, every single possible place. If we can't put trees there, then eliminate it and use that extra space for the um, for the bike lanes and allowing for the um, uh, for the addition for for the continuation of some parking and some travel. So, I am a hundred percent in favor of those designs over what the city has been working on because it seems to me they can be done quicker, they can be done cheaper and they can provide exactly what we've been asking for. Um, so I, I, I think one question is how advanced are the discussions with the MBTA about the catenary wires? It seems like those discussions have already have happened. And either of the designs where there's only either one traffic lane down most of Mass Ave and then at the corners, there's either a left lane or a right turn lane for just half the block seems to me to be a brilliant and quite doable um, solution or to keep the two travel lanes, but then make sure that um, there's parking allowed by re re reducing the median. And in some cases, the sidewalk is wide enough. So I really hope that we get there. I hope it, I don't think we need a five to 10 year construction plan. I am in favor of using quick builds everywhere possible and 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 moving forward as, as soon as possible on that. So I, I would hope that we would move forward with that as soon as possible. And, and I hope the city, if they haven't seen these plans, I'm very interested in understanding what their take on it is. Thank you. Um, Councilman, did you uh, have a direct, want a response from council or should we go to, to other councilors? I'm happy to, for, for you, it's up to you, Chair, if if it makes better more sense for the staff to just hear from a few councilors and, and 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 basically queue up all the different questions. We may have similar responses. It may be more helpful that way. I, I, I do appreciate this conversation and I'm very interested and totally supportive of that bike lane all along Mass Ave. And I don't think we have to sacrifice all the parking or the ability to travel. And I'm not sure we need to continue to have two lanes the length of it if, if, if we want to have an incentive for traffic to go elsewhere. That makes sense. Yeah, I think we can hear from uh, other councillors and then uh, go back to staff. Um, so we'll go now to, to Vice Mayor Mallon and, and then to Councillor Zondervan. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And through you to the city staff, I am glad that we're here having this conversation. I think starting this conversation now is, is critical. Um, I do think it was unfortunate the way the report was presented because it, it did seem to be inflammatory um, given that you know, it wasn't that block by block analysis. And I understand that as part of the ordinance, the report was necessary, but I, I hope that when we get to different segments, um, as we move through the cycling safety ordinance, that we can take the lessons that we've learned from this report coming forward and being just 
we're removing all the parking on both sides all the way down and just seeing what has happened in the fallout and just learn from it and, and be able to present the information in a different way or, or come up with a different process. If, you know, if something needs to be changed in the ordinance in order for us to do that, then, then let's talk about that. Um, I am, I'm glad to hear, um, and thank you to Ruth Riles for pulling everyone together and, um, and really talking about Mass Ave as needing a road diet. I think that we all, every, all of us on this call probably agree that it is like a highway in the middle of our city. And, um, you know, I think the median actually really contributes to that. Uh, in some way, um, first of all, it encourages bad behavior both for drivers because it feels like you're on a, a really fast road when you're actually in the middle of somebody's neighborhood. Um, at the council level, we get uh, hundreds, if not more, emails every single year about pedestrian safety and how it's just not safe to cross Mass Ave, even with a flashing blinker, um, because people are just going too fast. And I think that the median contributes to that. At the same time, I think I've I definitely, I'll say that I'm, I do this all the time, where you see that median as a pedestrian, you're not going to walk the half block to go to the crosswalk. You're going to go because you can dart onto the median and be safe and then cross the other way. So I think thinking about that median as being um, something that we ne definitely need to think about removing, we should definitely do that. Um, I, I do want to go back to this I'm a plus one on, on Councillor Nolan's question around the conversations about the catenary wires and where we are on that. However, you know, when I'm looking at the schematic and the width of a, a you know, a typical fire truck, which is 10 feet, there is room um, if you put a bike lane and the buffer for the fire trucks to come down um, and be in that bike lane and that buffer zone. Yes, I, as Nate Fillmore said, they, they do need those supports, but where um, where are those hollow sidewalks and can that be thought about in that block by block analysis or can we fill them in, right? I mean, we've been filling them in on Mass Ave and Central Square. Uh, there's ways to do it. It is a little bit expensive, but should we have hollow sidewalks? Just period. Um, so thinking about things like that, um, being creative, I think you've, you've seen, I think, for city staff, we, we're at a place right now I, I actually think is exciting. We've got small business owners, we've got residents, we've got cyclists, everyone's kind of on the same page here that there's plenty of room to, to work with. Um, people are willing to be creative and people are willing to give up a little bit of parking and moving some of that parking to side streets. Uh, I think we have a really great opportunity to have this kind of collaborative group work together um, and get this done because this is a really, really dangerous stretch of our city um, roadway, and it would, it would, it's going to be hugely beneficial for us to meet our climate goals, um, to have separated bike lanes all the way down. But also, as Councillor Sabrina Wheeler mentioned at the beginning, this is people die on our streets, right? It's scary out there, um, and so we need to be. We need to be working with some urgency here, and I, I'm glad that we've got this collaborative group together working with some urgency around solving this really critical issue in our city. So I'll yield back at this time. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair, uh, for the for the time. Thank you. Um, it was pointed out to me by city staff and Councillor Zondervan that we have school committee member uh, Aisha Wilson uh, in the, the Zoom and had her hand up. Um, Councilor Zondervan, if we asked if we could could go to her first for a uh, public comment and then uh, go back to him if that's uh, possible, Mr. Clerk. I believe she should be able to speak now. All right, uh, Aisha Wilson, please uh, go ahead if you're in the Zoom. Hi, can I find my mute button? Are folks able to hear me? We can hear you. Great, thank you. And thank you um, to the chair for allowing me to speak in um, to the counselors and everyone that's here on the call. Aisha Wilson, school committee member. Um, do I need to see my address and all this stuff? I don't know, <laughs> my first time speaking in public comment. Oh, no worries, yeah. Okay, great. So I just wanna speak and I did come late, so I do apologize that I wasn't able to hear many of the presentations, but um, know that it's a very robust conversation and um, it's a very touchy conversation on many levels. And I just want to speak really as a resident um, of the North Cambridge area and a person who really supports our small businesses and 
who has traveled up and down um, Mass Ave um, all my life for the most part um, via you know public transportation. When I was younger, I used to ride bikes. I don't anymore because they're scary to me. Um, but as even a driver and just thinking about how do we incorporate all community voices into the conversation of um, the safety of our roads. And, um, you know, one, one thing that I know living here on Garden Street is that when we think about the shared roads and that was what we had here on Garden Street, just how dangerous that was, because I think the implementation just was not, um, it just wasn't a, a, a real, I think the thought was there but the actual implementation of it was really more dangerous than, than I had ever expected um, for the side of the street of my home, um, for cars, for bikers, for walkers, um, for everyone. And I really want us to think about, you know, how are we bringing more community voices into the space? And when we think about the, what the construction will look like for this Mass Ave, which is our major, our major roadway, that the, that traffic is going to then transition into our communities. What is that going to then look like? How are we implementing, um, you know, thought, how are we having thoughtful conversations with our residents around what that's going to look like? How is that going to impact our roads and our streets for our residents? Um, and, and I really think that we need to give this some more thought, that we need to give more time to this. And, um, you know, I appreciate our residents for speaking up, our, our small business owners for speaking up and speaking out about um, some possible solutions. But I do want to just emphasize that um, that there is a need for um, some more some more time, some real care carefulness in terms of how we actually go about a project this large in our city and how that's really going to impact our greater community, um, especially this um, more North Cambridge um, area of the community. And again, I don't want to see more traffic kind of deviate, you know, have to be detoured into our residential streets because Mass Ave is no longer um, the main road that folks can take to, to get up and down. So I want us to think about this a little bit more, and I am not opposed to environmental safety and climate justice. I think that those are things that are very important, and we need to be thinking about that, but we also need to then think there are individuals who drive cars. There are um, roads that folks are on, and we want to think about safety on all ends of that, as well as convenience for, for individuals too. Um, and again, just thinking for our small business owners or, or just our, our businesses in general, how they are going to be able to function or how will they be impacted throughout the, the, the time of construction um, and so much more. So I just wanted to really raise that and bring that into the space. Um, I know Richard Harding was trying to get on this call as well and was having some difficulty. And I don't want to necessarily speak for Richard, although he said I can. And he said that this is just not a great idea at all. Um, but I will just say that we need to have more discussion around how we actually implement this and how we um, do this thoughtfully um, as a community. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go now to uh, Councilor Zanderman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I share many of the same sentiments uh, as my colleagues. Um, you know, as a bicyclist, I've been bored myself um, on on our roads, um, and I think it is really encouraging the way this this conversation has ha been happening so far, because um, we're hearing a lot of creative solutions, which I think is exactly what we need. Um, the one one question, and again, I, I don't need an immediate answer, but I, I would like the staff to consider that the you know the analysis assumes the same traffic patterns as if they're static, but but of course we know that if we change the roads, then the traffic patterns adjust. And, and if we take away lanes or, or make uh, adjustments that people find other uh, ways to get around, including not driving. So I would like to have that be considered as part of the analysis instead of just assuming that the same number of cars trying to get through um, fewer lanes. Um, and particularly as, as we continue to add 
um, bus priority lanes and, and bike protected lanes, we should see a, a mode shift away from individual cars. Um, similarly, when we look at, at the parking issue, um, and, and I do want to give a, a shout out to the guitar stop because I, I actually bought my guitar there um, a few years ago. But of course, I can park on the side street because I have a resident sticker. Um, and so the idea of having some uh, metered parking along the side street is a good one. And, and I think we, we really underutilize that. Uh, in Cambridge. Now, I do hear from the restaurants that it doesn't address their situation. Um, we have similar concerns in, in Eastern Cambridge. But my belief is that fewer and fewer people are going to be um, visiting restaurants in Cambridge with a private vehicle and, and looking to park uh, for, for many hours. Um, because we will again have many more convenient options, and of course, when when one goes out to dinner, there, there's simply no need for a car. Right? If you're buying a guitar or something like that, it's more uh, understandable that people would want a car to transport something large. But when you're going to dinner, um, it's a night out. You know, people can drink and, and not worry about having to drive and, and all of those things. So, um, I think the the restaurants will will find that their customers will still come. Um, and then my last comment is that, you know, I, I too am frustrated by the way this, this report was dropped. I, I understand that it's um, essentially just complying with the ordinance, but um, I think the way it, it came across was, was a little off. And in particular, I, I don't see it as an either or to do quick build or full construction. I think we may, we may have to consider both, right? And, and again, there's there's some case-by-case -case, uh, scenarios here, but in order to get this segment of Mass Ave uh, implemented, we may have to do some or, or even all quick build uh, in the short term, and then in the longer term, uh, replace it with, with more um, permanent construction. So, you know, I would like to see that option considered in in this report, in this segment, and, and in future uh, reports as well. Um, so again, really encouraged by this conversation and by the way the businesses and, and residents came together um, to present some real solutions. And I hope that uh, we can hear those and, and that the traffic department uh, can come back with, with some more uh, practical proposals for how we can get our bike lanes implemented quickly and, and improve safety for everyone uh, without uh, unnecessarily impinging on the on the businesses. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. I'll go down to, to Councilor Carlone. I think we do need to first um, have a motion to extend um, the meeting uh, if the committee is all right with that. Um, so if a motion from Vice Mayor Marilyn to extend the meeting uh, by 15 minutes. Um, Mr. Clerk, could you take the roll? I'm extending the meeting to 7.15. Vice Mayor Mallon. Yes. Yes, Councilor Nolan. Yes, I'm not sure I can stay, but I will try. Yes, Councilor Toomey, absent. Councilor Zondervan. Yes. Yes, Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. Yeah. Yes, motion passes, four in favor, one absent. Okay, thank you. And Councilor Nolan will uh, have a quorum if you do leave, uh, have to leave at seven, so no worries. Um, I'll go now to, to Councilor Carlin. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, any complex project is not solved by a simple solution. And you, we've heard today how complex it is. It's even more complex. It's a state road. And um, the state, I assume, will be involved in any kind of redesign, but Joe Barr and his staff can answer that later. I live in this neighborhood for the last almost 40 years. I know it intimately. Um, I had to fight to get a crosswalk at Garfield Street, believe it or not, uh, back when, uh, when I first moved into the neighborhood. Uh, Ruth Ryle's comments, I totally agree with. Um, and that's the point. 
everybody is right. And to think again that a simple solution would resolve that is, is as the vice mayor said, it, the the city public uh, website probably should have had a caveat that said this doesn't work or it doesn't fully work. So number one, half the traffic in the city doesn't end here or begin here. So if we did reduce the road width or road number of roads, Central Square has three active roadways looking at all the directions. Um, much of uh, Harvard Square now has similarly number of roads. Um, Harlington from the city line up to Arlington Center is three lanes. Um, I, I think, yes, it's different in Cambridge, but is it that different? Uh, I think that has to be thought. Number one, the sidewalks are not reinforced. I learned this one with uh, Ruth Riles. I was part of the Mass Avenue Improvement Committee and um, we learned that the city does not put reinforcement bars into the sidewalk. We could talk later about why, but they don't. Um, this is an urban design problem. It isn't just traffic. Everybody recognizes that because community development is here as, as well as DPW on top of that. And that includes all input, all needs need to be resolved and that's why it will need to be studied in depth. The interesting thing I see is that the width of Mass Avenue in this part of the city, my neighborhood, is pretty close to what it is in Central Square. Um, look at it. I mean that's that's where we're heading one way or another. So I think it's a retail issue, it's a business issue, it's obviously transportation issue is leading the pack. It's putting pedestrian improvements in. <clears throat> By the way, when you put rest places for pedestrians, sales go up 10%. It becomes a more attractive place to be. And that's the goal, as my neighbors have said, that how can we make this work and make it a place for people to be and not through traffic? Uh, all the counselors talked about this. Yes, we have slow traffic at time, at times. Other times we have speeding traffic and uh, kids cross Mass Avenue to go to school all the time. I had a friend whose child was almost hit by a car. They notified me of that. Um, the vice mayor mentioned crossing midway of the block. Well, if crosswalks are 800 feet apart, 500 feet apart, you're going to walk across that damn median. And a real thriving retail area has crosswalks at 200 feet. Um, so this is very complex, has to be done right. We have to make it safe for everyone. And I mean bicyclists as well. And I think we'll get there. I think what the transportation department has done is said, maybe only now, but they knew that this, their what they showed us in the analysis wouldn't work and that we need to do it correctly. Um, I'm for doing it correctly. Thank you for letting me speak, Mr. Chair. And Quinn got me that there is one person who signed up for public comment uh, who wasn't available before but is on the, the Zoom now, uh, and that's James Williamson. Um, if it's possible to that him and James. So, and can you hear me okay? You can. Yep, you have uh, three you. minutes. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I was listening to a lot of uh, the, the earlier part of the meeting and the Cambridge Housing Authority. Can you hear me okay? We can, yep. Um, so the Cambridge Housing Authority had a board of commissioners meeting and they were taking up the relocation agreement for Jefferson Park where I live, 1000 Jackson Place. So I switched over there and back and forth. Um, I do live in North Cambridge. I do take the 83 bus and often switch to the 77 bus in Porter Square, um, among other things, spend a lot of time now in, in and around Porter Square. Um, and of course, along the corridor and in Harvard Square. Um, 
one, there's, there, I have a feeling, you know, that people talk about the various constituencies that have been involved and that are important. And I sort of feel like, and I, I did miss some of the meeting, but I sort of feel like one very important constituency that are left out are, are those of us who take public transit. And so I, I really want to bring in the dimension of what is the impact on public transit, on bus service, on the speed and efficiency of bus service along the corridor and um, also on the opportunities to improve that. There have been service cuts. There may be, there's been some restoration, but the, I, the ideal is to move forward with improvements in service that would include things like bus rapid transit, dedicated bus lanes, buses being able to change signals, um, um, when you ride the bus now at night, you know, you hit red lights all the time and there's not a lot of other traffic. I mean, there are things that could be done now, but that's, that's so, but the focus is on bicycle infrastructure and I get that. And I'm not entirely averse to um, separated bike lanes. I think they work in some places. I think the Brattle Street uh, example is a fiasco, but um, so please take into consideration the impact on bus service. Um, I also think there's an idea, if, you, if you've been in Washington, uh, in Pennsylvania Avenue have the bike lanes in the middle of the street. And if you had bike lanes in the middle of Mass Ave, uh, taking account of some of the other considerations, you might, that might work in, in a number of ways, but it might also address the catenary wire uh, problem um, and you, I'd let you, I, I invite you to think about that and consider that if maybe it was considered and discussed, I don't know. Um, but I also think as I stand waiting for the bus as, as in Porter, I see bicyclists just ignoring all of the rules of the road, the red lights. Um, and I just think it's really important that we include the behavior of bicyclists when we talk about safety. They're making, they're, they're making it's unsafe for themselves the way they ride. Not all of them, some are very good, um, but I just think that has to be an important part of any conversation about bicycle safety. So thank you. Thank you, James. And um, we're gonna go now to uh, city staff for additional comments. Um, Mr. Barr or Ms. Watkins, um, if you wanna go ahead. Thank you. So I think I'll start and then um, with a few um, follow-up comments and then turn it back over to Joe. So a couple things about, um, I think a number of the cross sections that folks showed, I think are certainly ones that we've looked at from Mass Ave at various times over the years. I think one of the things we would just really emphasize is that they don't fall under quick build. So there's a lot of options there and there's a lot of potential, but a lot of the things that we were really talking about tonight in terms of opportunities for removing the median, opportunities for you know, or enhancing the meeting with tree plantings or, you know, other sort of larger scale, um, more comprehensive improvements really fall much more under, you know, the slides where we talked about construction. So again, I just really emphasize that some of these small things aren't really feasible. When we look at a corridor like Mass Ave, we look at, you know, the, um, the medians have traffic signals on them that starts to require other work. If you look at you know, again, excavating near utilities, what are the other improvements that we need to think about? So I think, you know, if we're talking about a full construction project, that's a very different scope. So it's sort of looking at the challenge is really looking at what are the impacts of quick build versus what does a full construction project look like? Um, and again, there's the city infrastructure. And I also just want to talk a little bit more about the catenary wires because some of the, the options that, again, I think make a lot of sense when you look at Mass Ave. Um, don't work with the catenary wires for the buses and so in the fire department. And so again, what, we just want to keep coming back to that. Um, and, you know, we talked a little bit about sort of the next steps and over the next year is to really dive more into those issues and think about what are the options and are there places where we could do construction? Are there places where, you know, we can work with the T on the modifications of the catenary? I don't know if that's feasible. That's part of a conversation. We're working with them on other streets. It can be quite challenging. So I don't want to be, you know, that is not a short process. Um, and I think as we're looking at these types of construction, these are not, they're big benefits and you can really do the comprehensive work that I think, you know, Ruth talked about. And if you go back to the work we did with her and Councillor Carlone 
on the Harpo block, you can get a lot of benefits, but it is a different sort of animal than quick build projects. And then finally, just with the fire department, just to clarify, so there are no hollow sidewalks in this section of Mass Ave. Um, the fire department doesn't necessarily know where they're hollow sidewalks. And so there's sort of standard protocol is that they don't put outriggers on the sidewalk um, because we do have hollow sidewalks um, in some locations in Harvard Square and Central Square in particular. And then there's also issue around damaging sidewalks and then also other conflicts with sidewalks if there's outdoor dining or other things that could constrain um, their access. And so, there's, so their protocol is to not put the outriggers on the sidewalks, even though, but I did wanna clarify that there's not actually hollow sidewalks in this section of Mass Ave. So I think those are the things I wanted to focus on. I'll turn it back over to Joe. Thanks, Kathy, um, and uh, to you, Councillor, to the group. Um, I guess just a few other things to add, or well, one to reiterate, which is I just want to make it clear that you know the the design options that have been you know shown. I think these are all things we've we have, as Kathy said, you know talked about both over the years, but also specifically in terms of what we think would be potential, you know, better options for Mass Ave. So I think it's not that we're we're ignoring those possibilities, but a, as Kathy said, some of them are actively in conflict with, you know, the continued, um, you know, existence of the catenary. And B, um, you know, I think we we, and this is, I know it's a delicate topic, and I know there's frustration amongst counselors about how the this report was presented. But I do think it's important to say that, you know, the ordinance also contains the sort of what I describe as a kind of poison pill, which is if we can't agree on the, what the actual plan is going to be, and and it if that involves some construction, then we are required to do this by, you know, some version of a quick build by uh, 2024. And so I think it's really important for everyone to understand what that could look like. Again, I'm not saying we would do it exactly as that report lays out, and I'm not saying we wouldn't apply any additional, you know, thinking or, or thoughtfulness to the project, but at some level there are certain fixed items that we have to account for and and that we don't have a lot of flexibility or control over like the catenary. So I just think it's really important for folks to recognize that we 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 don't intend that to be the plan, but it is important to understand that, you know, that is kind of a, a starting point and and but hopefully not an ending point. Um, but we are certainly open and, and have talked about a lot of the different possibilities um, that, that were presented uh, you know earlier. Uh, the, I guess the other two things, one is just you know reemphasizing you know the transit piece. Um, because you know, I think it's 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 we're we're more than okay with looking at things that you know reduce capacity for cars and and, and trucks, acknowledging that there are potential impacts associated with that. But like Councilor Zondervan said, you know, people do change their behavior, um, and you know, we're, we're we've I think shown in other projects that we are willing to you know suffer additional vehicular delay if that's what it takes to make a roadway safer. But we are also very sensitive to the need to not you know punish transit in that process. And so we, we need to look very carefully and deliberately with the MBTA about what we can do to make sure transit continues to work well, because just as much as this part of Mass Ave is an important bike corridor, it's an incredibly important transit corridor, you know, with one of the highest ridership routes uh, in, in the entire system. So we just need to be really uh, sensitive to, to that issue. Um, and then finally, I think, you know, we, we do want to lay out a process going forward over the next you know, I would say probably six to eight months to have all these conversations in more detail, um, recognizing that, you know, by April 30th of next year, we not only need to present a plan to the council, but we also need to get the council to, you know, approve that plan as, as, as much as it involves construction. And so I just, uh, you know, I do want to be very respectful of the fact that, you know, we need to give the community enough time to react to, you know, different ideas and give us their ideas and, you know, have that conversation, but then we also need to give the council, you know, the, the opportunity to discuss, debate, have further meetings of this uh, committee and possibly others to, you know, come to agreement on that plan. So, you know, we are, we don't have those, the specifics of those next steps laid out, but, you know, we are having internal conversations and then we'll want to talk more with the council about exactly what that process looks like, because that, that really is the crux of the issue and listening to all the comments throughout the course of tonight's meeting is that, you know, people want to engage. I mean, in a way it's great that we have, we have all these folks engaged who really want to work with us to come up with good solutions and are, and are open to the idea of, you know, more significant changes to, to North Mass Ave, which is not always, to be honest, been the case. 
Um, and so I think, you know, it's, 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 it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited that we have such an engaged community. The council's engaged, you know, businesses are engaged and we sort of have the, 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 the pieces we need to be able to have that conversation over the next several months and then come to agreement with, with the council. So I think, you know, it's, I, I recognize, like I said, the frustration and, and the desire for, for more, but I think we are here to, to have that conversation. And this is the beginning of that conversation in, in no way, shape or form. And I hope everyone realizes this, it's not the, obviously the end of the conversation. Um, so, you know, we look forward to those, con to those discussions over those, the next several months. Hey, Mr. Barr. Um, I see uh, the Vice Mayor and Councilor Zondervan have their hands up. Um, I think we will uh, need to extend uh, the meeting to, uh, to accommodate those comments. Um, uh, so if we could extend for another 15 minutes. Um, Mr. Clerk? On extending the meeting to 7.30, Vice Mayor Mallon? Yes. Yes, Councilor Nolan? Yes. Councilor Nolan, absent. Councilor Chumi, absent. Councilor Zondervan? Yes. Yes. Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. Yeah. Motion passes. Three in favor, two absent. Okay. Um, and I saw Councilor Zondervan with his hand up first, and then the uh, Vice Mayor, um, Councilor Zondervan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, through you to, to Mr. Barr, I, I wonder if you could address uh, just briefly um, the timing and, and the possibility of doing some quick build and then coming in later with um, more permanent uh, fixes because I, I am concerned that, you know, if we say we can't do quick build and we have to go to full construction, then that puts us out, you know, five or 10 years from now, which um, is not what we're looking for. So I, I'm just trying to understand how much flexibility we have there. I mean, response? oh, yes, uh, through you, uh, Councillor. Um, I guess what I would say is that we're certainly open to looking at that and also to looking at, you know, what elements, even if we do say that some amount of construction is needed, what elements could be done as quick build versus what elements, you know, do require construction, you know, taking into account the fact that, you know, maybe there are locations where it's easier to trade off some of the factors or the, or the bus delays aren't as significant. And so we can kind of work around that. So I think, you know, we, we recognize, you know, and I think the council and the community have been clear about the need for speed, um, not of cars, but of, of implementation. Um, and sorry for the terrible joke. Um, the, um, but I think, you know, we, we do want to make sure we're doing our due diligence. So I think part of that conversation over that next several months is to figure out, you know, sort of Kathy may, may punch me later for saying this, but sort of what is the quickest build we can do, even if that involves, you know, some construction, but, you know, are there, are there things we can move more quickly? Are there things we can do um, that can be temporary and then, you know, come back later? And I think just to say with all of, and I know Councillor Carlone has, has mentioned this point several times in the past, with all of our quick build projects, our intent over time would be to come back and build those out, you know, in a more permanent way you know, because I think we all feel like the quick build is is a, you know, sort of just a, it, it, it's a necessary thing to get these things done quickly, but but the full build versions are, are better for a variety of reasons. Um, and so again, that will take a long time given the, you know, the the cost and, and construction and complexity involved, but, you know, our intent would always be eventually that we would come back and make, make these improvements in a more permanent way. So I think it's really just finding that balance on this specific corridor between, you know, what can be quick build now and built out later versus what really needs to be built out at this moment in time. I, the other thing I just want to say, and apologies for going back to a, a previous point, uh, Councillor, is that, you know, the other element that's really uncertain for us is just the future of the catenary in general, because as I think most, many, many councillors are aware, you know, the T has proposed to eliminate the catenary and, and eliminate the current track with trolleys and replace them with battery electric buses, but that's a controversial decision that I, I know the council has also weighed in on. Uh, and so I think we're, we're, I wouldn't say we're in a holding pattern, but it does sort of add one more element of complexity to the whole question because we don't actually know if, you know, may, maybe maybe that goes away in, in some not so distant future, or maybe it doesn't. And that's, that's a complicated decision that, again, we don't have control over. Thank you. Um, through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, would, so would you present another 
or, or a plan to us next? Uh, I guess we're not calling this a plan, but uh, how, how do we advance this conversation, I guess? Uh, to, to your counsel, Sabrina Wheeler, I, I would say that, you know, we, I wouldn't say the next step, the next step is definitely not to present a plan. The next step is to engage in, you know, some additional discussion with the community, with all the stakeholders that have been, you know, attending tonight and, and, and many others, I'm sure, and, you know, better understand. I mean, I think we got a good feel for obviously some of the concerns and none of them are, you know, particularly shocking or surprising, but, you know, have those conversations, try to better explain kind of what the different, you know, constraints and, um, you know, opportunities might be. So I, I think it'll be a little while before we're coming back with a specific plan because there's a lot of analysis to be done. And you know, Kathy alluded to a lot of that in her presentation. But you know, I think that we would we would want to have those conversations and then come back with a plan sometime. You know, again, with a I, I don't want to say a specific date, day, date or month, but with enough time that we can then have, you know, the discussions we need to have with the council. Uh, so we're not putting everyone in a difficult position of having to, you know, vote for or not vote for, you know, a construction timeline or whatever it turns out to be at the very last minute, you know, because obviously that's, you know, April 30th is the deadline, but you can't, we can't expect to come to you on whatever the Monday right before April 30th is and, you know, with the plan at that point and that you're going to be willing to say, yeah, that's great. Um, great. Thank you, Mr. Jim. Vice Mayor Mellon. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. That was really my question is how this, you know, conversation proceeds and more specifically how um, Mr. Barr and Ms. Watkins envision themselves working with the working group that has kind of come together, because I think that is a really powerful dynamic. And I'm just curious um, if there's any thoughts about how that will be moving forward. Um, maybe I can take a crack at that through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, you know, one of the things that's clear, and again, the way the ordinance is laid out was sort of this first thing is focused on quick build and then the next year is to really look at, okay, so what are the impacts of, you know, understanding the impacts of quick build, what are the options for construction and to try to better articulate what that means and what those opportunities are. And so we're in the process of getting some technical assistance on board so that we can have a consultant that will work with us to really look through more of these details so that we can really understand what the impacts are on utilities, what the opportunities are, but understand what the scope would look like. Is this, you know, I go back to this 2 million, 20 million, 200 million. We need to understand what we're talking about when we talk about construction, be that a little construction or a lot of construction, what that looks like in terms of what a real scope would look like, and then also try to piece together that. So um, it's sort of a, a little bit of a way of saying, you know, we need some more technical assistance to really start looking at those details so that we can have more substance to really have a, a conversation with folks. And so that's going to take us a couple months before we'd even really be able to start to have that conversation in a meaningful way that really says, you know, these are what the opportunities are, understanding what the costs are and what those trade-offs are. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. So it sounds like um, those conversations need some technical assistance. Then you'll re-engage with the, the stakeholder group or the working group that's been put together and that we would likely have another transportation committee meeting um, in the four months or so, maybe they, they set up, get set up quarterly until this process has gone through, because I think there's a huge desire, I think you're probably hearing from the whole committee um, to be kept up to date and not be surprised about sort of what is happening. So um, again, thanks to everybody for being here tonight and participating, um, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I had um, just one brief additional follow-up question, uh, and that was thinking about uh, how Mass Ave plays into the, the wider network. Um, it's a big project on its own. It also sort of creates other opportunities for uh, connecting the broader cycling network, uh, sustainable transportation network. Um, as we're adding uh, these uh, bike lanes, whether they're, they're temporary or permanent protected lanes, are we thinking about how it's connecting to, to other pieces? Um, I'm thinking in particular, of like there's one small section of Somerville Ave that connects to Mass Ave that doesn't have a, a protected bike lane yet right by the target. Um, could uh, staff just talk a little bit about how that uh, thinking is happening? Um, sure, um, and uh, I guess well that 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 specific segment actually, as of very recently, does have um, at least a, a portion of it now does have separated bike lanes. We actually were able to take advantage of the MBTA's work that they were doing um, on the retaining wall at the quarter square 
state commuter rail station, and and although it's there's there, there's it's a very short segment that's actually in Cambridge as opposed to in Somerville, we actually did put in some some separation there. But I think yeah, I mean the bike bike you know the bicycle network vision kind of is our guide for that. And although you know it can be some sometimes these projects are somewhat opportunistic or you know based on other things happening in the area, and so there are elements of the network that are kind of disconnected at times. I think we are also trying to look more at, at, particularly as we get more of these larger segments done to, 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 you know, connect things in some logical manner. So we're not just having these kind of, you know, a, a piece here, a piece there, you know, so obviously it's a major construction project, but, you know, I think having river street, you know, as the pair to Western Ave when that, when that project is done, you know, it's a really important addition to, you know, creating a connected network. So I think we are increasingly trying to look at it that way. Uh, particularly as we accelerate the pace of implementation so that we're able to get more done and we can kind of pick up pieces that are missing along the way. Thank you. Ms. Raymond, did you have a, another question or was that an, an old hand? I had an additional question, Mr. Chair, if you don't mind. Um, I know a number of the business owners had sent in uh, written testimony to Patrick Baxter for or this meeting and did not include the city clerk um, they may not have been aware of the process of how to get those um, communications on the public record. I'm just wondering if the clerk um, could let us know if there was any way um, we could get those emails as part of the public record, as part of this um, meeting, if there's a way to do that. If there's not, then he can probably let us know, but I'm I'm assuming there's a way to do that. If Mr. Baxter or the, or the um, uh, business community members emails um, city clerk at cambridgema.gov uh, by midnight tonight those items will be included in the record um thank you mr chair for you to the clerk then the business owners would have to be watching this meeting right now and understand that they needed to do that i'm just i don't want to put more work on mr baxter's plate but if there was any way to forward those on um, to the city clerk just maybe in a bulk batch or something just to have them as part of the record before midnight Yes. Oh, and uh, sorry to um, interrupt, but I think I, uh, Mr. Baxter just said he did not actually, he texted me to say he did not actually receive any emails directly. So it sounds like they either were sent, I know there was a whole series that were sent to, to the council as well as myself and the city manager, um, but it doesn't sound like there were any that were sent directly to him. If, if they were sent to the, the council uh, email, I, I believe I can get them to the city council office. So are there any emails that are out there we can uh, uh, try to collect them from the various city departments? Okay. We may also go. I, I had sent those emails. Is it possible for any one of you to um, email me the address that I'm supposed to send it to? If you just email to guitarstop at hotmail.com, I can forward the emails that I had sent anyways. I had sent the, the uh, 18 pages of petition, uh, the 58 online petition. So if somebody emails me the address to guitarstop at hotmail.com, I will forward on what I had sent. I can email you the, the clerk's uh, address in the roster. Uh, Mr. Barr, was, was there something you were trying to add? As you say, they may have gone to our general traffic and parking email address, in which case we can see if we can get those along. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to everybody for taking care of that. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you again uh, to the city staff for their presentation tonight and for all the work that uh, has gone into this. And um, thank you as well to the residents, including uh, local business owners, uh, neighborhood folks, uh, and safety streets advocates. Um, as I think we heard a, a few different times tonight, this was uh, a discussion about the required analysis of, of one particular option for Mass Ave, but by no means the only option. And uh, we heard about sort of the, the process uh, over the coming months to talk about um, the different options, including some of what was presented tonight um, and the discussion with the council and community groups about how to turn that into a reality. Um, so I'm, I'm really grateful to everyone that's uh, come forward to, to start this conversation and looking forward to uh, keep moving with it. Um, so with that, um, we can uh, have a motion to adjourn. So moved. On that motion, Vice Mayor Mallon. Yeah. Yes, Councilor Nolan, absent. Councilor Toomey, absent. Councilor Zondervan. Yes. Yes, Councilor Sabrina Wheeler. 
Yeah. Motion passes, three in favor, two absent. Thank you again, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks, everybody.